Hey Zutan Church, as we're getting ready for Christmas Eve service, I want to let you know that we do offer childcare and we offer childcare for the ages two through four. Um, if you as a parent could please register your child uh, on our website, there will be a link uh, to registration on the website. Then we know what kind of numbers we have. Um, due to COVID restrictions, we can only have a certain amount. So we would love uh, to have you at church and we'd love to have your kids. So if you could register, that would be great. Hope to see you there. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, I know we've been walking through Advent, and if you were here last week and um, you watched Pete's message online or in person, that was a ton of information. And like, I love how Pete kind of made a joke about it because he just kept going like in his brain, right? <laughs> when we dropped some of this truth, um, because it is deep. And I've been kind of warning you guys the last couple months is when you really get into the birth of Christ and study the early church fathers and the history and the Greek and the Hebrew and all that stuff, it is very deep. Um, but it's, it's important to know. These terms are important to know. But let me also say, because today is going to be another deep one, I'm kind of piggybacking off Pete's last week, um, that we're a church that no matter if you understand something, a lot of this takes a lot of time to understand it. The main thing we preach is love God, love people. Love God, love people. Because we can talk about all the deep theology we want, but if your theology isn't changing you to love God and love people more, it is a false theology. Or at least it's just a, uh, you know, it's just brain matter. It's just something that you can throw out at parties. Like, did you know the Greek word for incarnation is blah, right? It doesn't mean anything. What matters is that it's changing us to know Christ better and show Christ better. So that's the main important thing as we talk about this stuff is to remember that. But just know again that it's, it is important, but that's the main message is because these things change our hearts. And I was thinking about a story this week because everyone loves to get a good pump up, right? Like everybody loves to be encouraged. Everyone loves to be told they're doing doing well. And, and even when you're doing wrong, it's good to get some advice. And, and, you know, I have seen things change. And I think this happens to all people as they grow older. You always look at the generation now and kind of be like, oh, they're soft, they're weak, right? But when I was growing up and playing basketball, uh, my coach threw a garbage can at me. Uh, my coach said many explicitive words that would get people fired today. Uh, better times, better times. Uh, but there was a, a different kind of toughness that was going on too. And I remember in, in my junior year, that was kind of the year that, um, you know, I, I started getting a little bit better because, you know, puber puberty was finally kicking in. And um, I had this really good season, but I had one game that wasn't going too well. And it was the first half of the game, and I literally, I can remember this, I was one for nine from the field. And some of you were like, yeah, I had that guy on my team. He never quit shooting. He could have passed that whole time. I was that guy. And I was one for nine, and like right before the end of the half, um, I had this wide open shot from the corner. And I, I hesitated. I got nervous, because I wasn't doing very good, and I passed it. And I don't remember what happened after that, but as the, the buzzer went off and I'm walking off the court, uh, this guy grabbed me by the jersey and just ripped me back. Again, it was 1998. You could do that back then, better times. And it was actually my, one of my best friend's dads. And um, my, one of my best friends was actually my sister's age, who was three years older, but they always let me tag along with them and play hoop. And it actually made me a better hooper because you're always getting the snot beat out of you. It's good for you. But his dad was this rough, tough guy. And he used to be a basketball coach very knowledgeable at basketball, um, and he was there. He'd always come to all my games, and he was kind of like a second father. Again, he was pretty rough and tough guy, and he pulls me back, and he had this really unique accent. Even though he was from North Idaho, he talked like this. He always talked like this. Everything was this with a few F words in between all his words. And he pulls me back, and he was like, he called me Cloudy, and he goes, Cloudy, why didn't you shoot that shot? And I was like, Larry, I'm one for nine. And he grabs my jersey, and he goes, a good shooter would be one for 10. And I was like, what? And he was so mad that I passed that shot up, but he was trying to instill some confidence with me. Like, I don't care how many you miss, you keep fired up there because eventually you can be one for 10 or at least two for 20, okay? Let's shoot for that. But I remember like it kind of ignited in something me because he was trying to instill some confidence. He was trying to like, just say like, you know, trust yourself. And, and that's good, we all need that. And he was kind of like a, a second father in my life, but nothing is better than receiving a good word from your real father. 
It meant so much more. No offense to you moms, but you guys are really always positive <laughs> towards your kids. You're doing so good. You're so amazing. You look amazing, right? Like you guys are way more, uh, you know, energetic than fathers because we're kind of, you know, sometimes we got to lay the law down. And it's kind of unfair to us. Again, ladies, it's always like when your way doesn't work to discipline them, it's always like, Scott, 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 right? Then we have to jump in. But there is something special about receiving good compliments or some encouragement from your father. And that's what we're gonna look at today in this Christmas Advent season is that one of the main things that Jesus came to do, yes, it was to die for our sins, but one of the main things his birth was for was to introduce us to our real father, to introduce us to our dad. And we're gonna look at one of the most famous passages, uh, especially Christmas passages, um, and it comes from the Old Testament. And today is gonna be, again, a lot of words and a lot of different definitions, and it's gonna be kind of a mingling and a tapestry of the Old Testament and the New. But most of you have received a Christmas card with this verse on it. One thing I wanna tell you too is that like one of my main goals <laughs> as a preacher is to show you that the Bible is inspired, that if you really study the history and the culture and all that stuff, it does come together, but it's always pointing to one main thing and that is a person of Jesus Christ. But this verse is incredibly important to know because it was written in Isaiah, which was written 700 years before Jesus was ever born in the flesh. And they have proven it now with the Dead Sea Scrolls that they found in those caves that those guys hid, that it is proven that this was written hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ walked the planet and Christ fulfilled all of these things. That's important because that gives you confidence in what you believe. And so Isaiah 9, 6 says this, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Now, again, you gotta remember that this was, these letters, every letter was written to those people at that time. And the Jews were expecting their Messiah. And they were expecting this verse. Like they believed in this verse. They knew this verse. The problem was is they missed this verse. And if, if they would have really understood this verse or went back to Isaiah 9, 6, I think many more would have followed Jesus. But this is actually what got Jesus killed because he claimed to be one with the Father. It's right there in their text. But they had this, this lens and this view of who the Messiah would be. And they're like, yes, he's gonna be the head of the government, meaning he's gonna kill all the other rulers and leaders around the world and be the head of the government. And then I'm like, didn't you read Prince of Peace? And then they're like, yeah, but Prince of Peace, he's gonna kill a bunch of people and that's gonna bring peace. And so they had this lens of who he would be. So let me be clear. Jesus wasn't killed because he claimed to be the Messiah. There were lots of messiahs before him who claimed that. There were lots of fake messiahs since then that claimed it. He was killed because he claimed to be one with the Father. And if they would have just understood this verse and not taken their culture and their lens and their preconceived notions to it, many more would have saw it. Here's one of my points though. We can miss it too. 2,000 years later, we can take our Americanism, we can take our baggage, we can take our wounds, we can take our sin, we can take all those things to the Christmas message and we can miss it. So we don't wanna miss it. But here's what I've found as you know, I've gotten older and I've studied theology, the more you can strip yourself of your preconceived notions and what you think in your American lens is true, the better the message is. This was a way better message than the Jews had ever hoped for because Jesus was gonna introduce them to their father. See, they didn't talk like that. They talked to him as a holy God, but not a father. Now, here's one more important thing in that passage. Did you notice it says, for to us a child is born and to us a son is given. Why that's important is, because we've been saying this whole Advent season, is Jesus was not created when he was born in Bethlehem. He's always been. And it says he was a son before he was a child. 
So he was already a son. So Jesus was never created. Now I know like Pete did last week, how does that work? I don't know. It's kind of like when your son or your kids keep asking you, you know, all the time, well, where did God come from? What? <laughs> go play with Legos. I always try to distract him. What? You should go play Nintendo, man. Because I don't know. That's a really deep question. But what we know is it was predicted he was always a son. He was always with the father. But what he really was when he was given to us as a child that we've been walking through week after week after week is he was the symbol of grace. And we don't want to miss that. He was born to a poor family. He was born in a manger. He was not, the Bible says, Isaiah actually says, there was nothing attractive about him, meaning we wouldn't look at him and say, wow, there's the Messiah. They think he was probably kind of homely looking. There was nothing attractive about him. This is why we can't infuse our culture with him because we'll miss him. Meaning we are Americans. We love big and beautiful we love, you know, the guys who show off. And at this point, we just care how someone says something and how eloquent they are. We don't actually look and see what someone does. We just care how someone says it. And then, so that's why we can often miss Jesus because he was trying to show the world the symbol of grace. One of my favorite preachers says, God doesn't, grace doesn't sell. You can hardly even give it away because it works only for losers and no one wants to stand in their line. Grace is saying, I don't care how much money you got, how beautiful you are, you still have some issues and you still need a savior and that doesn't sell. And so I don't want us to miss this in our American culture that him showing us who the father is was incredibly important for everyone in this room and everyone on the planet. Well, if you've been coming for the last couple of weeks, we've been walking through a book um, as a church called The Honest Advent, written by Scott Erickson. We still have some copies. I know we're a couple of weeks in December, but it's a good book to read outside of Christmas too. So if you wanna go buy one, they're in the lobby, but we've been walking through this. And Scott Erickson says this, it's a simple fact that everyone has parents. I know not everyone has two parents around, but we're all the byproduct of two people, and that comes with a lot of wonder, weirdness, and weight. It's a wonder that we are our own person, but we can see so much of our parents in ourselves, in the way we act and look. Their imprint is unquestionable whether we like it or not. It's weird because family is something you don't get any choice in. You just appear in an inerrant connection with these other people for the rest of your life. You can have closer relationships with other individuals, but it's only a very small group of people in the world who will be your family and an even smaller group you will call your parents. They will eventually die like everything, but they are always your parents. Also, if you partake in naked midnight wrestling, <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff. That's, I told you, honest advent. You may become a parent yourself. <laughs> oh, some of you are just getting it now? Some of you are just getting that? What a prude. Anyways, and you'll feel the immense weight of that responsibility. It's a scary, wonderful, risky, and completely humbling and decentering, and at times entirely engrossing. I've already been interrupted seven times just writing this so far. You do see your parents in yourself and you start seeing things that good and bad. That's just how it is. You start seeing things that your parents did that you thought were dumb and then you find yourself doing it. It's so true. Wait, kids, just wait. And there's good and bad and I think that's great. One thing I see with my father is my father um, was a really deep thinker, like a really deep thinker. And you could tell when he was thinking about something deep. I remember when I would be driving in his car, you know, in his truck, we'd be going 50 in a 70 mile per hour zone. And I knew dad was thinking about something. Not only that is he was a talker, he talked to himself. He was, I mean, I'm in the car with him and he's going, and I'm like, is he possessed? <laughs> Is this gonna stay on the road? Guess who does that now? I can literally see Lily. There's been times when I've been in a full deep conversation with somebody and I've been thinking about something and I'll look up and Lily's like, like, who are you talking to? Should we call the cops? Are you going crazy? Like, I have that, but he was a really deep thinker and I'm that same way. My mother is a survivor. Like, she's just a survivor. Like, no matter what, 
My mom's gonna be cool. She's one of the hardest workers I've ever seen. She's had some incredibly awful circumstances happen to her in her life, but she's always working. She's always gonna make it. She's a survivor, and that's, that's me too. I have that in me that it doesn't mean I can't get down, doesn't mean I don't have my bad days, but I'm determined that I'm gonna finish the job. Like, I'm gonna keep going. So you see good and bad in your parents. The point of this is that Jesus came to show us exactly who the Father is. But he didn't just come to show us that. He also came to show you what the Father thinks about you. He came to show you in the flesh how the Father views you. He didn't just give us a bunch of words. He showed us in the Gospels. He lived it and showed us that. So that's what the Advent season all about. That's what the birth of Christ is, is Jesus coming to show you what you look like in the eyes of the Father. Now, when I look and study Jesus, I'm like, this guy's amazing. This guy had this way about meeting with people and talking to people. And I don't care what anyone says. I've studied all four gospels thousands of times. I never see him criticizing a sinner who's caught up in sin. I never see him bashing somebody. The only people I ever see him going after are the religious people who were keeping people away from knowing God because they told them they had to do a bunch of things to know God, religion. So if Jesus came to show us the Father, that's cool with me because Jesus is awesome. And last week, Pete, again, that was one of the best sermons on the incarnation I've ever heard. He, He talked about John 1, which uh, Mrs. Harrington read um, during that time of reading. And he said that John 1 is actually the new Genesis. In the book of Genesis, we're told God created this and God created that. John 1 is before that. It's kind of like Star Wars, right? The original Star Wars came out. They were actually number four, five, and six. And then in the 2000s, George Lucas ruined everything by making one, two, and three. But those were before the originals. So that's what John 1 is. So John 1 says this, in the beginning, like as far as we know, was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and all things came into being through him. And apart from him, not even one thing came into being that has come into being. For years, if you've come to this church, this was one of the major theological shifts that I had that really opened up the Bible. It opened up a whole new understanding of scripture because I've been telling you that Jesus is the word of God. He is the word of God. And people always kind of counter that. Like, so you're saying the Bible isn't? No, I'm literally proving to you this is the inspired word of God. But before the Bible was written, before man had a chance to give his view on things, Jesus was it. And so now we are literally be able to look at the whole creation, all of life, all of the Bible, all of everything through this new lens. John is telling us before Genesis, everything points to Jesus. And that word for word in the Greek is logos. It's a really fascinating word. There's a lot to it, but basically it means All intelligence started in this one point. It's the cornerstone of all life and intelligence, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the beginning. So whenever my kids ask me who created God, I say, I don't know, but I know the beginning is Jesus. He is the word of God. The real Greek there then, when it says he stood one with the father, it means face to face. He stood face to face with God. Now, what that is, is that is interpretive language. He's trying to say that when you look at someone, you're interpreting these words. And so this, John is trying to tell us everything in life, everything in existence, everything you go through, everything you're thinking has to be filtered through the word of God, Jesus Christ. And why that's important is because there's a lot of deception out there. And we lie to ourselves all the time. And so there's that verse that says, there's a way that seems right for a man, but in the end, it equals death. We can convince ourselves of a lot of things. We can tell ourselves a lot of things and we can tell us that God is telling us these things. All we have to do is go back to Jesus and the gospels and say, does Jesus say this is right? That's a beautiful cornerstone pinpoint for your life. 
on what to do and where to go. This is interpretive language. But this is how cool the Bible is. It didn't start in the New Testament. The Old Testament was always pointing us to this. One of my friends always likes to say about the Old Testament is that the Holy Spirit peeks his head out every now and then. And I have never caught this until this week, but there was a guy named Abram in the Old Testament. Some of you know him as Abraham, but before he got his cool nickname, his name was Abram. He was a pagan, he was a moon worshiper, and God called him out for a special purpose. And it was actually a covenant he was making with the world. But listen to this first encounter with Abraham. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. Now, most of us read that and we think it's a voice. And I just want you guys to know, do you know that God talked to the Old Testament people the same way he talks to us? We always think he was like, talk to them different. He didn't. He talked to them the same way as us. So I've always read this as like this voice from the sky or you know, whatever. But look what it says. It came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. If you're having a vision, you're seeing something. This wasn't just a voice. Jesus Christ, the word of God, came to Abram. Now, every time you read in the Old Testament that uh, they had a vision and the word of the Lord came to him, you know it is the actual word of God, Jesus Christ. That's pretty sweet. He was always coming to them because he was before them. Go on to verse 14 in John 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It means, it actually means he pitched a tabernacle. That's why when Jesus says you are the word of, meaning you you are the church, you are the temple of God, this skin, or what did Pete call it? Meat suit. (laughs) Pete called it a meat suit. (laughs) This meat suit is where the temple is. And the high priest Jesus rests in you. You are the temple of God. And he was pointed to right there. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Again, this is kind of a a funny passage because Jesus is full of grace and truth. And so the way we should live is whenever we're gonna lay some truth on people, we better do it in grace first. But what I have seen is is, is every time we mention this, if you're a grace-led church or a grace-led person, I always hear Christians say, yeah, but we're supposed to bring the truth too. Yes, but we always make it like a hammer. We gotta bring the hammer down on truth. Have you ever thought maybe we can bring good truth too? Maybe it's encouraging truth. Like, man, you worked so hard on that. Like, that's awesome. Isn't that good truth too? We always make this about something bad. I can't wait to tell him how screwed up he is. Now, there's a part of that. If you love somebody, you'll tell them when they're screwing up. However, it's supposed to be led with grace. But why can't we make truth and and encouraging people something good too? So I take this passage, and if Jesus is showing us who the Father is, he's coming to encourage us with the truth of how much his Father loves us and accepts us. Now let's go deeper. The word truth in Greek actually means reality. Same word. Jesus is full of grace and reality. So let me be clear. If you're in here, I give you tons of credit for showing up to church during a global pandemic. And if you're in here and you are seeking, God bless you. But the fact is, just because you believe something doesn't make it true. That doesn't make something true. Truth is truth. So Christ is the truth. And if you don't believe that, you're not living in reality. But once you believe the good news, you are actually living in the truth of all existence. So again, this is a clue. This is a key. This is the lens to understanding reality. And the reality is that Jesus tried to show us, he showed us perfectly who the father is and how the father looks at you. And if you ever wanna know truth, go to Jesus because he points you to the truth. This gets even better. Logos also means blueprint. In our English translation, it means blueprint. So in the beginning was the blueprint and the blueprint looked God face to face and he was the blueprint. 
Now, some of you construction guys and electricians and all that, you are like, you think it's probably easy at this point. Blueprints don't come easy to Pastor Scott. They're flipping them over and you're gliding them all up. They're like, oh yeah, that's that. And I'm like, like I have trouble with Legos with my kid. If you can read blueprints, I'm impressed. But I had a job in high school where I pulled fiber optics through buildings. It was a, it was a great job. And I'll never forget the first day at work, the guy's like, okay, you just read the blueprints and, and you just, you know, then you pull all the fiber optics through this. And I'm just like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, I had no clue how to read a blueprint. So guess who got to be there till two in the morning pulling out all the fiber optics that I pulled through wrong? Maybe I should have just asked, but I didn't. That's Jesus. Why don't we just ask him and know the truth? But the word logos means blueprint. So what this is saying, this is super deep. When Jesus was born, he is the blueprint of the Father. He is who the Father is, and he is showing the blueprint of who you were always meant to be. You are the blueprint, the design of the Father. And Jesus came to show us that. And what an amazing moment that had to be for the Father. After centuries and centuries and centuries, he finally was able to lay this out and show people what they were designed to be. One thing I always do whenever I'm maybe just not feeling good or I'm, I'm sulking or you know my life sucks or whatever it is, the one thing I do is to snap myself out of it, I watch military homecoming videos. You can't help but just either cry or at least be like, I'm a big wuss, right, when you watch those. A kid not seeing his father or mother for months or maybe years, and then they come home, like it instantly snaps you out of your sulking. I've shown a lot of those before at church. So my second favorite thing to watch, just to feel good about life, is when mothers tell their fathers or tell their husbands they're gonna be fathers. There's just something special about a dad seeing he's gonna be a dad. So let's watch some and bring some good energy into this room right now. Okay, give, give daddy the card. Do the card first. It's something behind the card. Okay. Read it out loud. Bet you're proud and feeling glad that soon you'll be a brand new dad. Shut up. Oh my God. <laughs> Shut up. Oh my God. Shut up. Oh my God. Shut up. Lily. Yo, shut up. <laughs> Lily, shut up. Please don't tell, please tell me you're not messing with me right now. No. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yo. Oh my God. Don't you do it. I said, no. oh my God. <laughs> hey, Bubby, show daddy your shirt. What? Are you, no, are you serious? It says brother. It says brother. Are you serious? Yes. You're not serious. Okay. Look, I'm gonna take a picture, okay? Okay. On three, I want everybody to say, ready? One, two, three. Say, we're having a baby. Mom's having a baby. Me too. No, just mama. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. You lie. <laughs> Not lying. How long have you known? Since this morning. Say, mommy's pregnant. Are you? Mommy. <laughs> For you, for my little baby. <laughs> I'm pregnant. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, whatever. 
<laughs> you know, you liar. So. I'm not lying. How? Would you please tell me what you're doing? Because it's kind of freaking me out. I don't like I it. said to look at her shirt. I saw it. It's a big sister shirt. Are you pregnant? No! <laughs> Why else would she be wearing a big sister shirt? Because she's grown into it. No! But I wouldn't put it on her if it's a lie. <laughs> Is that what you're trying to get my reaction? <laughs> Be nice to me, my wife is. Are you for real? Are you for real? Are you for real? Why didn't you find me out? It's my kid. So one, Men are incredibly stupid, <laughs> like, let's be honest. And two, it's like a mixed emotion of excitement and worry all at the same time. And I love that because imagine after thousands of years of watching his kids wander around and fight with each other, he finally got to make the announcement. And he's still making that announcement every day in everyone's heart, that this is who I am, I'm your father. And he's got billions of children. So let's keep this going. There's other passages that link Isaiah to the New Testament, to the birth of Christ. And one is Colossians. Colossians 1 is probably one of the deeper passages in all of scripture, but I'll do my best. He writes this, he says, Jesus is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God and the firstborn heir of all creation. For through the Son, everything was created, both in the heavenly realm and on the earth, and that is seen and all that is unseen. Every seat of power, realm of government, principality and authority, it was all created through him and for his purpose. He existed before anything was made, and now everything finds completion in him. He is the head of his body, which is the church. And since he is the beginning and the firstborn heir in resurrection, he is the most exalted one, holding first place in everything. For God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ. And by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. He is first place in everything. And right now, as our government is fighting and other governments are fighting and people are fighting, he is number one in the worldly government, the government that really lasts, <coughs> the, the government where all things come from. But here's the beauty of Jesus. He was born as a human. So not only is he the king of the heavenly government, he was born to Joseph. And Joseph was in the bloodline of David, King David. So when Jesus was born, he merged both heavenly governments and earthly governments together and brought all things into himself. Jesus is royalty. Jesus is a king. And in a perfect world, you realize that kingships would work better because there's one guy making the decisions. In our fallen world, it doesn't. But in the spiritual world, it does. I don't know if you, if you follow Shaquille O'Neal at all, but Shaq's one of my favorite characters like he's one of the funniest guys if you just watch he's such a goofball and he's he's enormous he's like seven foot three he's so big check out this bed that he had custom made his king bed he calls that's a big room by the way but i saw this guy from church post this and i like this even better this was the first king size bed a manger he is the king He's unassuming king, but that's who he is. Colossians 1.21 goes on to say, even though you were once distant from him, 
living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, he reconnected you back to himself. He realized his supernatural peace, or excuse me, released his supernatural peace to you through the sacrifice of his own body as the sin payment on your behalf so that you would dwell in his presence. What is that supernatural peace that he's talking about? Because if you're like me, you don't always feel that in this world. What he's talking about is you and your father, you're good. You're good with dad, and dad is good with you. That's the peace you should have. You might not have peace at work. You might not have peace at home. You might have peace in relationships, but when it comes to you and dad, you're good. Robert Capon goes on to say, the new heavens and the new earth are not replacements for the old ones. See, we always think that. They are transfigurations of them. The redeemed order is not the created order forsaken. It is the created order all of it raised and glorified. We always think that, is Jesus gonna bring a new heaven and new earth? Yes, but it's through his body. He is not going to just blow up the earth like the Death Star and create a new one. He's redeeming this planet. He's redeeming this place and you're a part of it. So here, let's get into this real quick and I'll wrap it up. This is profound. When he says you were distant and you were living in the shadows, what that means is when you're living in the shadows, it's not reality. That's not truth. That's not how God views you. That's not who you really are. So Jesus comes as the light of the world and shows us who the Father is and who you really are to the Father. And it gets even better. That word for evil, when it says you were in your evil thoughts, this is why I tell people to start studying some of the new translations because now that we have the whole world and it's connected, we're learning the Greek language better. The word for evil there is paneros. And what it actually means is annoyances or hard labor. What he's saying is at one point, we all lived in this weird fake world where we thought we had to work really hard with religion and good behavior for Father to accept us. But when we follow Christ, we know no matter what we do, no matter what sins we carry, we are accepted by God. There is no work to be accepted by God. That's really good news. And this is why Jesus got so mad at the religious leaders because they said, you need to follow these rules. You need to make these sacrifices. You need to do all this. And then God accepts you. And Jesus comes along and says, no, God already accepts you. Anytime you believe that you have to do something to get to God, that is a lying religious spirit. Jesus came in the flesh to show us you are accepted by God. So let's take it one step further. If that's what it means is hard labor, go back to Genesis 2. And Satan was at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was the knowledge of hard labor. And he lied to them. And he says, you know what? Your dad's kind of a, a mean dad, a mean God, and you gotta work really hard for him to accept you. And for thousands of years, he keeps lying to us, thinking that we have to do something for God to accept us. Now, as a father, do you accept all of your children's actions? No. But do you accept your kids as your kids? Yes. And Jesus came to show us that. Jesus came to announce the good news. I am thoroughly convinced that a part of the gospel is not just repent and feel like dirt or take communion or get baptized. The part, the best part of the good news is I've reconnected you with dad. Now believe the good news. And then those things follow. I see the life of Jesus because Jesus wasn't a guy who just talked. He actually did stuff. And you can't read the four gospels and not see that Jesus loved to eat with people. And he always ate with the people that were outcasts. And not all the time, he ate with the Pharisees too, but he knew they were trying to set him up. But if we have this many examples of him eating and drinking with sinners, how many more times did he do it? Because John tells us that if we would have wrote down everything Jesus did, we would have filled the world up with books. I think Jesus' main thing he did was eat and drink with people. He was called a drunk by the Pharisees because they're like, all this guy does is hang out and, and eat, eat bread and have some wine with these people. He's a drunk. He must have been doing it a lot for them to say that about him. But what he was doing was he was showing them his acceptance. He was showing them I will eat with you. I will sit with you. There's nothing you can do to make me not 
accept you at my table. He was showing you who the father is. If he's the perfect father, representation of the father, do you realize that the father says to you, no matter what you do, no matter what you believe, no matter what, you sit at the father's table. That's really good news. Again, any father in here, if your kids have to prove to you something in order for you to love them, you are a really bad dad. You're a bad dad. Now, again, does a good dad correct his children? Absolutely. But if a good dad ever, uh, if a dad ever makes his kids prove something to him before they're accepted, before anything, my kids know no matter what they're doing, they can always sit at the table with mom and dad and eat. That's what a good father does. And that's what Jesus came to show us. One more hard word. That word when he says he reconnected us with the father, that Greek word is apokalomena. And what it means is, <laughs> it's a really hard one. What it means is, I'll try it. Apokatolasso. Don't quote me on that. But what it means is, it's talking about value, original value. And so when he says, Jesus came to reconnect you with the father, he's saying he's bringing you back to know your original value to God because you've been lied to, you've been, you've, your sin lies to you, other people lie to you. God, Jesus came to show you your original value in God. Think about this. It's a currency term. When you go to a foreign country and you get there and you trade in your money, you're trading it for another currency. But guess what? I went to Africa and I traded in, a, I went to Guinea, Africa. I traded in $100 and got 1 million Guinea francs. I was a millionaire for the first time in my life, but I was trading it for a higher value to a lesser value. When Jesus came, he came and traded a lesser value for a higher value to show you your perfect currency in the eyes of God. Amen. That's incredible to think about that he took this value. Our currency equals death. That's what it does. Our currency leads to death. So he switched with us and traded a lesser currency for a higher one. And we're all millionaires in here with Jesus. These terms are important, they're amazing. So let me bring it home. Here's why this is super important. If you don't get the Greek, if you don't get anything, get this. This whole thing is talking about your acceptance. And when you feel your acceptance from God, he will start directing you because you want to listen to your father. This was a game-changing moment in my entire Christian walk. About three or four years ago, I was going through some stuff and uh, there was just a lot of drama, a lot of tension, a lot of stuff going on. And I was sitting in a parking lot at the gym and I just, I, I like, I couldn't move. My soul was dead. And I've always talked to Jesus my entire Christian walk. That's not bad to talk to Jesus, by the way. But I never talked to the father. Like Jesus is cool, right? He's the lamb. He's always hugging kids, feeding people. And then there's like the Holy Spirit. We're just kind of like, hey, we believe in you. Where are you, right? But then there's the father. And it's like, is, is father bad at me? Because we always take our earthly fathers and I had a great father, but we're always projecting onto father. And I had this moment where I was sitting in my truck and I was talking to Jesus and I heard him. He was like, whoa, 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 wait. He goes, let me introduce you to my dad. Because my father died in 2004 and I miss, I miss talking to a father. 16 years ago, I haven't had a dad. And there's times I could have used him. But I've always had a dad. And in that moment, Jesus like got out of the way and said, it's time you, it's time you talk to dad. And I've been talking to dad ever since. And there's a freedom to that. There's a freedom because I trust him and I trust him when he corrects me. And I believe that God speaks to all of us in our own personalities. So I'm a pretty blunt guy, if you haven't noticed. God speaks to me very bluntly and I love it because I don't trust people who don't who schmooze you. I don't trust you. If it's always this thing behind the thing, just tell me straight up. And he tells me straight up. And this happens all the time when I'm trying to fix something in our house because I am not a handyman. 
And I'm learning very quickly that that is one of my triggers is doing things handy around the house because I suck. You put a hammer in my hand, you're gonna have to go buy spackle because we're gonna be fixing some hole in the sheetrock. When we moved from our old house <laughs> and we took down the pictures, I was like, ooh, just hold, missed nail holes all over. I mean, it was bad. But since we got in this new house, my wife has asked me to put some new lights up and stuff. So now I have to become an electrician. I'm praying our house doesn't burn down, but I've been doing pretty good thanks to YouTube. But I'm not a handy guy. And so the Lord also blessed me with the garage, which is my safe place to say anything I want with no one listening. And I love it because I'll walk outside and it's like, you know, Joe Pesci on Home Alone. Frackers, 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 frackers. I walk out there and I can feel the father being like, how's it going? And he corrects me in a loving way. He's like, and again, he talks to me blunt. He's like, you know how stupid you look right now, right? You're scaring the kids. And I think you probably need to go inside and apologize to your family because you're acting like a demon right now. And it's amazing and I accept it. And I love having a father like that. And I trust the father because I first trusted Jesus and Jesus showed me the father. And it's so important because I hear him in those moments and he's correcting me. And it doesn't change my acceptance. It doesn't change his love for me. It doesn't mean I'm out of the house. It doesn't mean anything, meaning the father's house. I might get kicked out of my own house, but. And when you start getting to that spot, it brings a whole different level of growth and understanding because the father's constantly speaking to you. He's not mad, he's not upset, he can be stern, but it doesn't change your acceptance in God's eyes. Scott the painter goes on to say this. He says, you can never stop having parents. And if you have children, you will never stop being a parent. Jesus Christ died as a single man with no kids. And yet this prophetic word calls him everlasting father. I don't know if the mystery of this title will come to any full understanding anytime soon, but let us sit with the wonder of his name. Jesus, the one who is and who was and who is to come is forever relationally a child of parents. He had parents, he has parents, and they will forever be his parents. Side note, I always think what an amazing moment when Mary died and they got reunited and she walks through heaven, whatever that looks like, and he just gives her a hug. And you know what I think he said? Hi, mom. She's forever his mother. God has a mother. And Christ is a parent, is forever a parent to all creation. In his first chapter, the gospel writer John proclaims all things came into being through him and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Everything is relationally tied to him, including us, and we can never not be tied to him. Band, you can come on out. The birth of Jesus is incredibly profound because it brings all things together. It brought everything back to the father, including you, it fulfilled the promise to Abraham, to the entire world, and then he became Israel in the covenant of sacrifice. And most of all, he brought unity between his child, God's children and their father. John 17 is called the high priestly prayer, and it was Jesus's prayer before he went to the cross, and he prays for his disciples, but do you know that he prayed for us in this room too? 2,000 years ago, he was thinking of you in this room today. And he writes this, and I ask not only for these disciples, but also for all those who will one day believe in me through their message. That's us. I pray for them all to be joined together as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with us so that the world would recognize that you sent me. For the very glory you have given to me, I have given to them so that they will be joined together as one and experience the same unity that we enjoy. You live fully in me and now I live fully in them so that they will experience perfect unity and the world will be convinced that you have sent me for they will see that you love each, each one of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. 
I really believe one of the most important parts of the gospel, because if you don't get this first, the other stuff just becomes religion. You start reading your Bible because you think it impresses dad. You start giving money because you think it impresses dad, or you want dad to give something to you. And it, it, it creates this religion. I think one of the main things we need to get right off the start is accept your acceptance. Accept your acceptance by the Father. Because then when he does critique you or there are things we work on, you know it's out of love and that nothing is going to take you away from the love of the Father. And Jesus came to show us that. He's like, I know what you're doing. You wanna sit down with some bread and some wine and talk about it? I know what's going on in your life. You wanna sit at my table? Accept your acceptance. In Jewish culture, when you ate with someone, you were announcing to the community that they are your brothers and they are your friends and you accept them, which is why the religious people got kind of mad at Jesus. Because guys like me were sitting at the table. So I don't know what you're going through in this Advent season. I don't know what you're going through in your life, but stop believing lies about yourself. That is not reality. The reality is you are accepted and loved by your heavenly Father. And Jesus came in the flesh, left, his royal palace to be with us. So believe the good news. And some of you just take a moment and just say that. And I have to say it all the time. There's times when I'm driving or running at home, I have to tell myself that again. And so believe the good news and accept your acceptance in the eyes of your heavenly Father. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.